So I want to start by telling you actually three stories. Um, the first story is about a man named uh, Mahmoud Safadin, who is the uh, managing director of an organization called Darling Kenya. And Darling um, produces and distributes beauty and hair care products in the Kenyan marketplace. So braids and hair pieces and things that the um, hairdressers use. And the market isn't growing. So, and there's increasing competition. And so his challenge is, um, how do I retain my market share when new entrants are coming in? And he's got a million dollars to spend on marketing over the next year and a half, two years. You've got to be careful about how he spends it, but his challenge is, how do I use this as effectively as possible to keep my customers, my retail customers and my hairdressing customers? So that's one story. The other story I want to tell you, another story I want to tell you about is a woman named Carol Brown. Carol is a country director for an organization called Burrow in Ghana. And Burrow sells um, household products, largely um, charging and power, battery-related um, products. So batteries, power, um, they sell coal stoves and some solar-powered equipment. They sell it to distributors all across the country. And her particular challenge has to do with, um, uh, they've been six years in business and they're finally profitable. And now she's looking at the operation saying, okay, how do I grow? How do I grow this business but stay profitable? So we've had to figure out all of the challenges of transportation in a country that has, especially the further out you get, um, where power is even more needed, especially solar power. How do you, you know, how do we economically get our products out to the marketplace? So that's a big challenge that she has. And then the final story I'll tell you about is two entrepreneurs. They're in Ghana, or sorry, me, they're in Rwanda. Two young uh, men, their family owns land on the um, edge of Lake Muhazi. And it's a, a beautiful lake, it attracts tourists. And what they're really interested in is finding a way to take their family land and put a hostel or campground on it to attract backpackers. So they have a view of bringing tourists into Rwanda to see the beauty of the country and to um, you know, get the, get a, take advantage of the tourism industry that's happening in Tanzania and Kenya. Okay? They want to bring these people in. They need $19,000, which is a very large sum of money for them. They have to think about what's the business plan, how, I do, how do I build this, how do I staff it, how do I get the backpackers to come, how do I market. So I tell you those stories because those are three people we would not have known about five years ago. We know about those people because of this initiative, the Ubuntu Management Education Initiative. And part of our goal is to find and tell the stories of entrepreneurs that we capture in the form of teaching cases. So we send students and part of their task is to find an entrepreneur, to find a business challenge they face, and to write a teaching ca case and teaching note. And the teaching note is where they bring theory and concepts of business into how to teach this material. And now those three people are known not just to the Ivy Business School and not just to the African schools that we go to. Story, those stories are available to a global marketplace of business schools all over the world through our case distribution center. And so that, that, that knowledge, I, I view this initiative as an opportunity to undertake scholarship of integration and application, to find a way of bringing sort of the real world that's happening out there into the classroom, not just Ivy classroom, but business classrooms all over the world. We simply do not study in the business school, in management education, we don't study African businesses, unless they're massive. Right? There's lots of them, and the, the big ones, and they're usually um, you know, uh, large international companies that have located in Africa, but not necessarily indigenous African businesses. Um, so writing the case is a really big part of that, but, but, un, but side by side with that is an opportunity to show African business schools and students, un, and particularly undergraduate students, how to learn from these cases. So what they do is they take they take business courses, but they do it in a very traditional way. They read textbooks, they get lectures when they go into class, but they don't actually get a chance to see businesses in action, discuss them, and figure out what they would do. If they were the business people, what would they do? And this, uh, what, what Ivy does really well is case-based education. We know how to do that. We've done it since our inception almost 100 years ago. And this is one thing our community could do. So, the overall effort is to take every year, we now have sent 125 Af Ivy students to Africa, to four countries, to five schools, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, Rwanda's been a school that uh, we don't send to now, but Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Ghana are the, the countries that we send students to now. 
Um, and every year we send students, they do it as an elective course, so they do a coursework with me. I prepare them with intercultural understanding, understanding of the cases they're going to teach and the business environment there. And they go to both learn and to bring the opportunity with their peers to show them how to learn and study from and benefit from cases. Um, and it, it has resulted in over 2,000 African students earning certificates of completion over that five-year time frame. So we're into our sixth year now, um, and you know, we're, we're pretty pleased with the results. Are you going to give me a time? Oh. Um, sorry, seven minutes doesn't seem like a lot of time. Anyway, um, so this is the website. There are some beautiful videos, uh, one in particular that's on that website now that students did from last year that really show not just Ivy students, but the African students, what it meant to them to meet a future Canadian business leader. And for me, it's about if we put future Canadian business leaders together with future African business leaders, then at some point, and this has already come true for me, um, they'll find a way to partner and, uh, and take the initiative forward. So that's my approach to the SDG. I'm still trying to um, perfect it, make sure we're not stepping on toes, and we're creating value not just for us, but for our African partners. And that's really the next thing I need to work on. So that's my story. Thank you. It's, it's, I mean, approaching the quality education is not from beside from the view. Uh, maybe not necessarily in, in terms of um, the case method as it goes on. I think it's more of partnership. Um, so I'll highlight one main partnership with one institution, and uh, the institution is called Africa Regional Center for Information Science. Uh, it's in Nigeria. Uh, actually, when it was um, founded, it was supposed to be responsible for the whole of West Africa uh, in terms of uh, information science education. So uh, the partnership is more or less maybe if you improve uh, the quality of the faculty there, then you'll be able to improve the quality of the education. So uh, the partnership started in 2009, uh, when to a grant from the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, a junior faculty from there came here for six months. And so she was a faculty member there, but she was yet to get a PhD. So she came here, uh, worked with me for six months, developing the uh, the, I mean, the thesis proposal. Uh, so again, we tried again the following year, in 2010, another one came. So in our case, to she, I mean, develop a proposal, she was able to do a pilot study, and both of them went back. And within two years, they finished their PhD and their faculty members then. So we were able to help in that way. And along the line, um, we did put in a proposal to MacArthur Foundation, uh, my school, FIMS, and that school in Africa, in Nigeria. So we did apply and were successful. We got about $300,000 uh, for the partnership from 2010 uh, to 2014. So uh, some of the things that we did include we purchased books for their programs there, about $15,000. We purchased them and we sent them. Uh, we upgraded their IT network. Um, we purchased multimedia equipment for teaching, actually including teleconferencing systems. So then we were thinking, okay, it's possible that we could organize a course here and the students there would take, I mean, we also sit down and take the course. Um, we haven't been able to do that, but that was the intention. Along the line, two, six of the, uh, six of their scholars did visit at different times. Uh, I mean, the senior one will stay for four months, the junior one will stay for six months. So while they were here, they were able to take advantage of uh, films, I mean, the Western resources, work on their own projects, and uh, went, went back. Uh, then my our own assistant, Dean, actually also went to Nigeria for a week. I think she gave, um, uh, a workshop to doctoral students on popular writing, and she also gave it a uh, university lecture. In my own, on my own part, as the um, Western director of the project, actually I visited every year from 2010 to 2014, and each time I was teaching um, a research method course to the PhD student. Um, 
review thesis proposals, co-supervise PhD students. And actually then we also could, uh, we developed a curriculum for their bachelor program. They did not have a bachelor program then, so we developed a curriculum. And uh, what we also did was to uh, publish two journal articles for my experience in developing the curriculum. Yeah, the partnership actually ended 2014, or well, I mean not the partnership ended in 2014, the grant ended in 2014. So, but uh, we've tried to continue the collaboration one way or the other. And uh, I think the latest one was um, a visiting scholar from the university coming in August last year through the grant from African Institute, Western International, and also FIELS. So she was, she was here for four months. Uh, from August 7 to November 30. I mean, she, she was able to give uh, interviews. She was, um, I think, a feature in the Western News. She attended uh, Bramba. She gave her own talk. And we also collaborated on the project. Actually, we submitted the, the paper for, for publication. We are waiting uh, maybe for, for feedback on it. And, uh, so that's with that institution. I've had another partnership with another institution in Africa using the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship. Uh, uh, also partnership with uh, UNISA in South Africa. But the major one has been that Africa Regional Center for Information Science. And what I also believe is actually if what I'm looking for right now is a grant to be able to organize a summer training workshop and bring junior faculty members from there to come to West Ham for maybe four weeks and um, be able to uh, do some, yeah, impart some knowledge. Mm -hmm. So in, in a short way, I think that's my own vision about it, uh, which is a way of improving quality of education. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good to go. Um, I want, as an introduction, I want to say that Quality education for all is really a noble goal. And it is at the center of all of the other 17, the other 17, uh, the other 16 goals. All of them are 17 and yeah, they are all interconnected. They are interconnected. Um, And I say here that like all human beings, and that's part of the philosophy behind my course, uh, all you know, uh, international service learning, uh, like all human beings, the UN Sustainable Development Goals ought to be interconnected. And everything I'll be saying, even what I call uh, a holistic approach, whether it's intercultural competence or Ubuntu, back to Nicole's presentation, they are holistic. They are holistic. As even ourselves, in our own identities, self identity or collective, it, there has to be interconnectedness. Otherwise, why do we even do anything together? Uh, for what which purpose? So um, it, it says that that's the platform. The platform ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote life learning opportunities for all. This is extremely important. These are uh, heavily loaded statements. Um, inclusive. What does it mean? And how far are we going to go into inclusive inclusivity? And equitable, equity. What is equity? Um, what is um, what is equity for you know uh, again for uh, education, life, life learning, lifelong learning opportunities for all? Look at this expression for all. What does it mean for us? For all, we are thinking of our communities around here. We are thinking of developing and and uh, developed countries. And what what do we? They call uh, what do we call um, yeah, education for all? Um, these holistic approaches. I'm mainly uh, using in intercultural competence that comes really mainly one of the leading scholars in this area is Donla Diodov. Uh, 
who is the director, executive director of the American Institution of International Education um, at Duke University, who has developed this and is really now known as, again, as the leading figure in this area. And intercultural competence is what allows us to develop attitudes and knowledge and skills and, you know, attitudes towards others, respect, openness, and so on and so forth, knowledge of the others, and of ourselves first and of the others, and the skills that will help us understand the other, the other cultures, and then desired internal outcomes that inspire us, that perform us individually to be able to, to really be effective um, in first of all, within ourselves and then for the world. External is what other people will see. If we talk, if we are interculturally competent or we have Ubuntu, that's what's going to help us understand other cultures and show that we value other cultures. There is no way we can really talk about quality education if we are not, if we don't value other people's cultures. And thinking that ours is are superior, that's, that's a little bit uh, backwards and uh, um, really back to maybe a century ago. Um, these are my students, at, you know, at, at my students, you know, you all students in Rwanda. You see them in and, uh, the traditional outfit, the man in, in the middle is uh, the prime minister, and usually that's what the the, the traditional, official traditional outfit when you meet uh, uh, high up people. Um, Ubuntu education for others. Ubuntu is defined as I am because you are, or I am because we all are. So that, that the idea of selfishness does not really have any space in, in uh, really in developing a reliable, acceptable, respectable environment for people, for human beings. You are because of other human beings. Otherwise, on ourselves, we are nothing, really. We are nothing. If we get 10 PhDs and uh, lock ourselves in a, in a room somewhere and read and write, that will not make us powerful, efficient. efficient. And I, I want to and here, edu again, education beyond education. There is knowledge. I kind of disagree with the colleague from, from Kenya. There is knowledge out of uh, Africa. You know, there is a lot of knowledge. There is. My students will be the first. All of them, the 78, no one will ever say that they didn't learn more than they, they gave, that they received much more than what, what, they, what, what they gave sometimes even guilty at the end, feeling that they, they have not really, they acknowledge that they've learned a lot. Otherwise, why, why should we even continue the program? Uh, here, the students, so, sorry, oh, sorry. Um, uh, the first slide here, the students are, may, are making um, fertility necklaces that people use in Africa because they don't have money to buy you know, contraceptives for every day. They don't have that money, even if, sometimes not even for once in their lives, for some of them. So they make fertility necklaces that help in schools and in the neighborhoods and the villages the, you know, that help women, those uh, institute women and the young girls who really need, who need uh, to, to do that, we need that. It doesn't cost anything. You just learn how to make it out of paper. Um, I have students here who are teaching in a, a school and orphanage, and also doing really, you know, doing more than just education, and showing that we what we do has some relevance. Uh, the three young ladies here uh, are the winners of the World Challenge. The Challenge in 2015, um, and used, worked on a project, uh, Kugera, which is again family planning and sexual health, um, and one one is uh, out of uh, I think maybe 60 
teams that competed for this. Um, quality education is important and is at the center of uh, uh, all we do and the, all, all uh, the other uh, SDGs, but also I would say that it remains a challenge for it if we think in communities, in, the nation, in national communities, in the regions, uh, in the world, especially when we say for all, it, it becomes, it, it remains uh, a challenge. Thank you. Thank you.